It's good to be in God's house tonight, right? Amen, amen, amen. I came uh, excited, anticipating tonight, and I hope you came also excited and anticipating the movement of God tonight. Amen, amen, amen. 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 Keith, come on up. Steve, get ready. Steve Becker's like, okay, yeah, I got this. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Paul. How many of you remember what Wayne preached about this morning? I'm not that old. That's good. A few people actually remember. That's really good. Well, the subject that he preached about kind of made me think about something that I heard a number of years ago. I wanted to share that with you tonight. Justice is receiving that which you deserve. Mercy is not receiving that which you deserve. And grace is receiving that which you can never deserve. Now, the thieves that were crucified alongside Jesus, they received what they deserved. That's what they deserved for their crimes. The penitent thief, he even admitted to that. He said so. That was justice. Barabbas, Barabbas received mercy for his crimes, murder among them, because he was released rather than Jesus at Passover. That was mercy. We are the recipients of God's grace. We didn't deserve it. God's only son gave his life for us knowing that many of us would refuse the sacrifice that he made. Knowing that we'd throw it right back in his face. But he did it anyway. That is love. That's grace. It's time for us to take up our tithes and offerings. We have the ushers come forward, please. Brother Roger, would you mind saying the prayer over the offering tonight, please? Will the God that is loud. That's his loud. That's loud. Wow. Turn me down. Turn me down. We won't have no speakers what? left. You got me that what? loud. I can't hear you now. What? Well, the God that I serve, he cannot fail me, and I know that he will always be around. He's God that rules in heaven. He's the God who makes us shout. And I know God is God. 
having fun. Amen. If you have decided to join the church, now is the time to come forward. Come forward, Tin Man. <laughs> I love doing this, and I mean it sincerely. I've had a chance to talk with these fine folks, and I believe they are fine folks. Amen. I believe they're hungry for the Lord. I sat in the back watching the night hold hands and praise God together. Yep. I saw that too. Somebody say amen. amen. I like seeing that. You've heard the saying, a family that prays together stays together. A family that praises together has a whole lot of fun. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. You guys can look at me for a moment, please. Ashley, well, I don't know. <laughs> she said, I don't know that I've ever joined. I was like, well, we'll bring you in. I don't think she did, did she? Nope. Lori said no. So, And by the way, if you're a young in here and you've never joined the church, you're more than welcome to do so. Just let us know. All right, I've got to ask you some questions. Here comes the scary part. Do you agree to sign over your checkbook? No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just that wasn't that one get added. You realize in presenting yourself for membership that you are assuming a solemn obligation and that it is expected that you will always be true to your promise and faithfully fulfill and discharge your obligation as a loyal member. Do each of you publicly confess and testify that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and the full pardon of your sins? And you may answer, I do. Are you willing to walk in the light of the scriptures as it shines upon your path? And you may answer, I am. Are you willing to abide by and subscribe to the discipline of the Church of God as outlined by the scriptures and set forth in the minutes of the International General Assembly? And you may answer, I am. Are you willing to support the church with your attendance and temporal means to the best of your ability as the Lord prospers you? And you may answer, I am. I'm going to pause there for a second. I feel my father-in-law coming out at me right now. When you become a member of the church... You become a part of the church. Amen. The church becomes yours. Yes. Amen. Not just mine. It becomes yours. Yes. It means you will support it by being here. Mm -hmm. It means you will support it with your tithes and offerings. If you want the church to grow, you're going to have to help us make the church grow. Amen. Mm -hmm. If you want the air and the heat to stay on, you're going to have to help us make sure the air and the heat stay on. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. When the carpet gets worn like it's getting worn right now, you have to help us with that. Yep. Somebody say amen. amen. I have dreams in mind for our church. And the only way for those dreams to be fulfilled is through you folks. Amen. I wish I was rich enough to do it by myself, but I'm not. That was my sermon after that. You didn't know you were getting that. Do you agree to be subject to the counsel and admonition of those over you in the Lord? And you may answer, I do. If there be any member that has a legal objection to any of these becoming members of the church of God, speak it now. Thomas isn't here to raise his hand. Amen. <laughs> then by the authority vested me as a minister in the church of God, I take great pleasure in bringing these threes into our local church. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you now to come around, shake their hands, hug their necks, and welcome them into the Mission Church of God. Amen. Russell, Carrie, and Ashley. There's room. 
shout in Beulah Land. comes the hard part. Amen. Now they get to preach their first message. Oh, time out. No, 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 no. Just say something. Testify. I just want to thank the Lord for saving me, and I want to thank him for giving me a partner in life that that uh, praises with me. And I just want to say that uh, I was diagnosed with four autoimmune diseases, and one of them uh, is a very rare disease, and uh, they they told me when it progressed that uh, it's called, more or less, they call it the concrete disease. And uh, my whole body would turn stiff, and the only thing I could move was my eyes. But here it's been five years, and I can still praise the Lord and talk, Amen. and, and Amen. I can still walk. I just thank God that he saved me. He took me out of that nasty world, and I, I'm just in love with God. here because you really have made me feel welcome and I'm so glad to consider you our family and I thank the Lord for bringing me here. You can be seated. Get one more big hand clap. How about that? The secret to being a successful member at the church <coughs> is to remain faithful to it and when the problems come Notice how I said that. When they come, work to resolve them. Amen. You know, one thing I've learned as a pastor is people will jump from church to church to church to church to church. And you know what they're looking for? The perfect church. You know what I have learned? There ain't one. That's right. <coughs> Amen. There's not. You know why it's not perfect? Because of you. I'm not saying that to be funny. There's people involved. And when there's people involved, we have mood swings. Amen. Good days, bad days. We are Christians some days and not others. Help me. We give grace some days and don't give grace some days. Right? We're patient some days and we're not patient other days. Somebody say amen. How many of you are like that? Raise your hand. Well, look around you. I just want you to see that. Because if you're like that, then you've got to expect other people to be like that. Is that right? And if you expect other people to be like that, then it's easier for you to forgive them. Amen. Children's church, walk back quietly and slowly. I know they get all excited to run out of here. I get it. Lori, come on up and sing, my beautiful bride. I don't have any jokes tonight, so I'll be nice. I've been requested to sing a song by, by Paul, of all people. 
Um, there's power in prayer. Amen. There is a lot of power in prayer. I'm telling you what, prayer, when you go, I mean, when you really sincerely get down to praying, God will move heaven and earth for you. He will. He will. But you gotta, you got to be willing to wait because sometimes we got to wait. You know, and that's the hard part, waiting, but believing. You know, I was talking to somebody today, and their situation, in, in, in human eyes, it just doesn't look good. But I reminded them, this is just our temporary home. We're just passing through here. This is not it. And I'm glad it's not it. I got better things waiting. Amen. Oh, Daniel bowed his head and prayed. The no answer came. Twenty-one days. It seemed that God had not heard his servants pray. But an angel was sent from God that same day. But the prince of darkness stood in his way. The angel overthrew him. I
if we could keep that thought in our head when we go to work on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and keep that song ringing, responding in our ears, we wouldn't need this sermon. I mean, that's just as simple of it. Before I get started, though, Brother Bob Bart, he, Barth, he wants prayer for his back. He, they said he has deteriorating back. So we want to pray for him. He can't get up and hardly move around, so we're going to come down and we're going to pray for him. And if you would, yes, he's fine. Just stay right where he's at. We'll come to him. And if you would, church, just stretch forth your hand this way. I believe in prayer. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to 2 Timothy. I mean, I'm sorry, 2 Peter, chapter 2. Starts in verse number 5 through 9. It says, God didn't spare the ancient world either. He brought the flood on the world of ungodly people, but he protected Noah and seven other people. Noah was his messenger who told people about the king of life, that he was God's approval. He has God's approval. God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed them by burning them to ashes. He made those cities an example to ungodly people of what is going to happen to them. Yet God rescued Lot a man who had his approval. Lot was distressed by the lifestyle of the people who had no principles and lived in sexual freedom. Although he was a man who had God's approval, he lived among the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Each day was like torture to him as he saw and heard the immoral things that the people did. Since the Lord did all this, he knows how to rescue godly people when they are tested. He also knows how to hold immoral people for punishment on the day of judgment. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you, great God, that you know exactly how to keep us safe, God. That you know how to protect us, God. You know how to move heaven and earth, God, to have your will done in our lives, God. Lord, I ask you to touch each and, each and every heart and mind in this sanctuary tonight. Lord, I ask you to use me, great God, as a vessel, God, for your Holy Spirit, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. You have a seat. You know, we talked about this in Sunday school. We talked a little bit about it. I know Lori, she alluded to it some. How does the, if you look at the way the world is or you look at what's going on in that person's life, then it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to see the negative part of it. We send our children to schools that tell our children there is no God. We send our children to college, and that college tells our kids that knowledge is more important than God. Some of us go to jobs, for the most part, that are totally godless. Some people live in homes where the name of God is not even allowed to be uttered. This is the society that we live in. If you look back in verse 8, it says this. It says, each day was like torture to him as he saw and heard the immoral things that people did. We go to church three times a week, so more if we're lucky if it's a revival. But the things of this world has a tendency to creep into our lives, into our eyes, and into our minds. It's easy. We were talking about today in in Sunday school how the overseer of Ohio, his wife, died of cancer and he wrote a book because the whole church of God was praying for her but she passed away and I told the the class I said you know a lot of times we see these great miracles done 
and in here we're praying for a miracle, and we feel like that God either chose not to answer that miracle for whatever reason, and if we allow it to, if we dwell on it, if we think about it, and don't put our mind upon God, but put upon that thing, it's easy to get discouraged. I've seen a lot of people leave the church and leave church and do other things and try to do anything because when that temptation comes or a trial comes, they don't know how to overcome it. And they see someone being blessed and they're crying out and they feel like they're in the desert and God's not listening to their prayers. And over a period of time, when they're looking at the circumstance instead of God and they see other people being blessed or they see someone getting a major healing or something like this, and, they're, and they're, what they're praying for does not come. If you take your eyes and you look at that situation, it's easy to become discouraged. It's easy to become doubtful of God. It's easy to doubt God's word because my Bible says that I am blessed. And sometimes, I'll be honest with you, in the day-to-day goings on of life, I don't feel blessed. And I have told one of the gentlemen down there who went with us, I said, you really, really, really need to write down all the blessings that God does for you. Because there's going to come a time, there's going to come a dry time when God wants to expand us and grow us and stretch us that we're not going to feel those blessings. And we have to call upon those old blessings those, and remember and bring to remembrance all those blessings, Brother Raj, that God did. See, it's not really the big ones. I try to really look every day for the little ones. Like I told Thursday about the rain, how God stopped the rain in the middle of a downpour that I can do my job. Because walking around outside work soaking wet is miserable. And he did it three times. And, but I look for those. And I, and I store them away. Because there's been a lot of prayers in my life that I felt that God didn't answer on this side of heaven. You know what I'm saying? There's healings that didn't happen on this side of heaven in my family. I have a sister that has deteriorating MS. I pray for her all the time. You know, has God healed her yet? No, but can God heal her? He absolutely can. See, we, we forget that the God we serve is awesome. We forget sometimes in when we're looking at that prayer not being answered that God is still this awesome God that can still raise the dead. And unfortunately, that we, we have a tendency as human beings to forget about that or to put that on the back burner and simply look at the situation in front of us. You know, just like that man did. I mean, you know, he couldn't understand it. He saw him healing after healing and all of these years in his in his ministry, and yet when he really wanted God the most, and he felt like the whole church of God was praying, she passed away. But we have to remember, if you're praying for healing and you're a Christian, you're healed. God sees you in glory. He sees you as you will be. And we have to remember that. There's a plan and a purpose for everything that happens in your and my life. Everything. There's nothing that we are touched with or that we are, that that touches us or communicates to us or, or touches this body that does not go through the hand of God as a child of God. But the problem is, is we have a tendency to forget about that. That minister, like I said, he wrote a book and he said it's getting easier, but then when it first happened, it just rocked his world. And Satan wants nothing more to but to rock your foundation. He wants to destroy what you're standing upon. Because if he can get you to doubt God, if he can get you to disbelieve the word of God or do anything like that, he has you exactly where he wants you. He has you in the wilderness and you're all alone. We are never alone with a child of God. God is with you. He's walking beside you. He's holding you up. The Bible says he bears you up with his right arm. We have to remember that. It's easy. I don't know what it is what about the human beings, but we have a tendency to focus on the negative instead of the positive. 
I remember as a child, I can remember every bad thing that happened to me. I can't remember all those really good presents that I got. I can remember the lame ones. You know, like I said, we pray, we read scripture, we fast, we come to church. But, and then I, like I said, I know that the pastor's been preaching for probably at least two months about victory. I mean, we have the victory, but sometimes we feel like that that victory is far from us. Peter, when he got out of the boat, he had the victory. He walked on the water. When he was going under, he still had the victory. He was still walking on the water. It might have been neck deep. It might have been, he might have been sinking in it, but he still was walking in victory. God had to reach down and take a hold of him. Immediately, he came back up. But the problem with it is, is, is he, was, he forgot that he was walking in victory. He forgot about the victory that he had when he jumped out of the boat. I mean, seriously, there was the, the, other, the other guys were just standing there watching and looking around. They saw him walk on the water. Why didn't they get out? You know? But he, he got out and he walked on the water. It wasn't until he started looking around and started looking at the world itself in general that he forgot that he was walking on water and then he started to sink. All through scripture, you can see the same thing over and over and over again. Christians have the victory. And all of a sudden, they, the cares of this world just kind of creep in and they forget that they're walking in victory. And if they don't write it down, if they don't dwell on it, and you don't think about it continuously, you get caught up in a discouraging way of thinking. And if you continue in that, you'll turn around and walk away from God because Satan is really good at picking apart those discouraging things. He's really good at saying, oh, God's not listening. Oh, God doesn't hear you. Oh, God's not there. Oh, those people don't care about you. Oh, all these things. He's really good at that. He's had a thousands of years to practice, ex tell you exactly how to discourage you. And we think in ourselves as a man, we think that we can overcome that. The only way you can overcome Satan is with the word of God and with the spirit of God. If you try to overcome him by yourself, you're going to lose. He's had too much practice at conquering men. Too much practice. And just for the 51 years that I've been here, I haven't seen everything. He's more than seen everything that I'll ever deal with. And he knows how to get me. That's why I have to stay rooted and grounded in the word of God. Because when we forget that there's power in prayer, when we, as soon as that, that thought starts to diminish Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, when we're on our job and we're walking around godless people like Lot here, it said that it was like torture to him. I've talked to some of you guys that work in secular jobs and some of you, I've talked to some of the teenagers that live in godless home. It's like torture. And you cry out to God, but yet it still remains the same. But we forget that it's not torture. It's a ministry. You're in that job because God placed you there. You're in that home because God placed you there as a light. You're in that job as a Christian. We have to stand up for what we believe. We can't cow down to those godless people. God put us there as a ministry to them. We can walk around and think it's, it's torture and God's not listening, or we can realize that God's walking in that company with us, and we can stand up and say that we're a child of God. We can act like we're a child of God. We can read our Bibles. We can do whatever it takes Bible studies, wherever, just stop and pray. And then God's in that place. And once God shines his light into that place, God's there. And it can change. God doesn't need multiple thousands of people in a, in a job for him to conquer it. He needs one willing vessel to be obedient unto him, and he can conquer anything. But see, we forget that. We walk around and say, you know what? It's torment. It's hell on my job. 
We can walk in torment and torture, but we can realize that we're a child of God, placed by God in a place that God ordained for us, and we can be a light into that place. And when we start thinking that way, no longer is it torture, but it's a blessing. No longer do we have to walk around discouraged in that place. But we can walk with our head held high because we serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It took me a long time to bide my tongue on my job. It's not easy. Sometimes, and as soon as you step out, as soon as you say, you know what, I'm going to do that, and let me tell you, all hell will bear against you. That's why you have to be fasting and praying and talking to people in church and asking for prayer, asking for someone to come alongside you and be a partner to you on that job. Because when you start stepping out for God, there's a big bullseye that comes up on your forehead, your back, or any other part of you. And he will bombard you. He will stop you because he does not want you speaking into the darkness. He doesn't want the Spirit of God speaking into that company or into that home or into that situation. He does not want that. But that's what you and I are called to do. The Bible says that God saved Lot out of all of Sodom and Gomorrah. If he can save one man out of two cities, he can save you on your job. He can save you on your home. He can save you in your marriage. He can save you in a relationship. It does not matter what you're going through. It matters how you go through it. Because when you go through it with God, you can accomplish anything. I've seen dead things raised to life. I've seen dead marriages raised to life. I've seen dead relationships raised to life. I've seen all this. In just a short amount of period of time that I've been a Christian. And I count it a blessing. But we have to remember those things. We have to write them down. Because if we don't, we have a tendency to lose that focus. We have a tendency to, to put it on the back burner because there's something that's in front of us that we need to take care of. And that's exactly what Satan's going to do. He's going to put a lot of things in front of you that you have to take care of so that you got to keep pushing God back a little further, a little further. Because that's exactly what he doesn't want God in the forefront of your thoughts. He doesn't want God in the, in the, for, in the forepart of your praise and your worship. He wants you up here thinking about all the things that's going on in your home. He wants you up here thinking about all the things that's going to happen tomorrow on your job. He wants you to thinking about all the relationships that are broken. He wants you to think about all those broken things instead of the God, the only God that can actually heal those things. Because that's just what, he's do that's what he does. That's just what he does. See, we feel like that when we're going through those things, that we're going through them all alone. Or we feel like that we're the only one going through it. We feel like that God's not listening. He is listening. He is attentive. But the problem with it is, is sometimes the blessings aren't real big. They're not transparent. Sometimes we don't even know what God's saving us from. And we won't know this side of heaven. We won't know how many train wrecks and crashes and things that were going to take us out that God protected us from. We won't know that here. We, we, we never will. But there are blessings out there that are hidden from us that God blessed us with. And we won't know them this side of heaven. But when we get over there, we'll know everything. And when we get there, we'll realize all the protection that God had for us. We'll realize every time that God blessed us. We'll realize that a lot of those blessings that we thought were very, very small were actually just the tip of the iceberg of blessing. See, sometimes it's just the, the, the little piece upon the top of the water that we see, but there's something underneath of there. There's something big underneath of there that God has for us. We have a foundation that goes all the way back before the beginning of the world. It's not just a tip. It's massive. The blessings that God's got for his people are massive. And in these last of days, they're the worst, but they're also the best. 
for whatever reason it is, God said, you know what? I want you here now. It's your time. It's our time to change the world. God put us on this planet this time to be here, walking on this earth this time in the greatest and the worst of times. They're trying to take away the Second Amendment. They're trying to do all these things. But I'm not afraid. My God's still in control. I know what can happen and what will happen if they do because of what has happened in the past. But it still doesn't make me fearful. It doesn't make me afraid. I just can't get away from this. Since the Lord did all of this, he knows how to rescue the godly people when they are tested. Each day was like torture. It says in verse number 7, it says, Lot was distressed by the lifestyles of the people who had no principles and lived in sexual freedom. Is that not the character of the United States today, the world itself? We can look at the character of the world and be distressed. Or we can look at God and say, you know what, God, you are totally in control. Dustin, can you bring that little baby up here? I ask him to help me with the sermon. He goes, do I have to say anything? I'm like, absolutely not. Just precious cargo is good enough for me. All, everybody say, aw. There you go, there you go. Look at mom back here, man. She's got a big grin. Here's my thought. A lot of us, Julie, when we're going through things, we feel like that God is over here. We feel like that, yes, God's walking with me. Yes, he's here. But if I was that little baby, guess what? If that little baby's over here sitting on the chair, she can get hurt. I can't get to her. You see what I'm saying? I, I physically cannot get to her before she falls to the ground. That's the way a lot of Christians feel like that their walk with God is. God's beside me. He's right up here. He's real close. He's hovering around. But I can still fall. I can still be hurt. Yes, he knows when I'm going to fall. Yes, he knows when I'm going to be hurt. But that's not the case. This is God. This is us. There is nothing going to hurt that little baby that does not go through his hands. She is not going to fall. She's not going to get a bruise. She's not going to get a bump until he says it's okay. Every bruise, every bump, every scar that you have is for a reason, and God allowed it to happen. 